Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, continuing my discussion with Larry Swedro, who for three decades was the head of research at Buckingham Wealth Partners. You can learn more about his story in episode 645. Larry's unique because he understands the academic world as well as the practical world of investing. And today we're going to discuss chapter 11 from his recent book, which is called Enrich Your Future, The Keys to Successful Investing. And the chapter title is The Demon of Chance. And I want to just highlight the quote that you mentioned right at the beginning of it. And this is by Miriam Benzman. Uh, from Institutional Investor in January 1997. And that is funny that you mentioned this because I was thinking, how do you find these quotes? But it says, people often see order where it doesn't exist and interpret accidental success to be the result of skill. Larry, take it away. Yeah, so if you could put up this chart uh, from the book, Andrew, I'll get started. As you know, we like to use stories and an app that help people uh, understand uh, a complex subject uh, by creating an analogy. Uh, and this story is that it's 19, uh, sorry, 2003, January, the start of the year, and an investment committee of a big pension plan of a, co- a corporation. Uh, they're there to discuss the performance of their plan choose the managers again, every review performance every year. And they go through a a long due diligence process, including looking over a long history. Uh, In their case, it's 15 years. uh, And it's come down to these six funds. And here are the returns. And after their discussion, they decide, well, the Larry Swedro Investment Trust has the best returns. Uh, you know, we should choose it. So maybe maybe I'll review the returns just for the audience who can't see it if you're listening. Uh, Larry has a uh, a list of, of returns by the uh, ranked by the highest return to the lowest. The highest return, of course, is the Larry Swedro Investment Trust at 14.3% average annual returns from 1988 to 2002. The second best is Leg Mason value, which is very close at 14.2. Then you got Washington Mutual at 12.4 for that same period. Fidelity Magellan at 12.3 for the same period. S&P 500 index. Well, you could just put your money in an index and you're going to earn 11.5. And then there's the Janus fund at 11.3. So we've got a ranking and lo and behold, the Larry Swedro Investment Trust is at the top. Continue, Larry. Yeah, and what's really interesting here, of course, is Leg Mason Value Trust was run by a fellow named Bill Miller, who had set a record. He had done something that had never been done before. He had, uh, although we didn't know it at the time, because the period went through 2005, he beat the S&P 500 15 years in a row, not cumulative over the period, but every year, and his streak at that time was 11 or 12 years. Uh, And yet the Larry Swedro Investment Trust outperformed even legendary investor Bill Miller. Now, the committee says we should do one final review. Let's bring Larry in. Uh, (laughs) We've checked the returns, they're consistent. Volatility's low. We've looked at all kinds of sharp ratios and volatility measures and looks great, but let's do a final due diligence and we'll grill him on his investment strategy. And so I walk in and I said, explain, well, my strategy is very simple. My wife's name is Mona. And so M is my favorite letter. And I just built a portfolio of all the stocks that began with the letter M and I value weighted them, market cap weighted them, and each year I would rebalance the portfolio. So now the question is, do they hire me, Andrew, or not? What do you think? I think they may have gotten a little bit startled by your methodology. <laughs> yeah, this is a, meant to show the example that you're of that quote that you cited, that we often get confused or make the mistake of attributing skill to what could be a purely random outcome. 
uh, and just lucky, right? The result of this example is a data mining exercise. It was actually created by Dimensional Fund Advisors at a for a conference I attended, and they just ran all the letters <laughs> and found that M had the best returns. And so they, you know, created a fund and I just used that same example. And, you know, we have used in our previous calls an example to show the same thing. The, it's the coin tossing example we've gone through. So you start out with 10,000 participants uh, in a coin, uh, sorry, 5,000 participants in a coin flipping contest. And you say heads wins and we'll see how many in a row you can get, well, half of them randomly will get one heads in a row. Now you've got 2,500, then 1,250, et cetera. And after 10 rounds, randomly, we should expect 10 to win. Now, would you put any money on those 10 winning the next coin flipping contest? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I When I read that in the book, I was just laughing because I never thought about it that way. I always looked at it from the perspective of the past and ask, did those people have some sort of skill to get where they were? But to think about, okay, so ready, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to put your money down. Which ones are you gonna put it down on? And I think that behavioral bias tells us that people are gonna say, oh, 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 I have to put my money down on those guys that won, but we know there's, there's no, there's no uh, it's, it's purely random. Well, I'll give you another example. It's not in this book, but there's a, a statistics professor and he's teaching uh, this class and he asks everyone to, he's gonna leave the room and he's gonna ask everyone to pull out a coin and flip it and then mark down whether it was heads or tails, okay? All right? And then uh, he says, I'll come back, you hand it in and I'm willing to bet and they're going to have to do this 100 times. And then he is willing to bet he can predict which one is, uh, is the real coin. Because everyone, one person has a, a real coin and the others all have an imaginary coin. So I forgot the setup. So everyone's got an imaginary coin. They're flipping it in their head marking it down, and one person has a real coin. How is he able to predict with almost 100% accuracy every year which person had the real coin? Well, what thing, does he look for? One, one thing is, you know, you know that there's there are streaks at times that are random, but, um, but with a traditional coin, you're going to have very close to, you know, a random outcome that's going to be not contingent upon the prior ones where I think the, the the individuals who are imagining it may be coming up with some patterns and things that would be strange patterns compared to a random coin. Well, you're in the right direction, but the answer is when we flip the imaginary coin, we tend to put T, H, H, T, 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 H, O, you know, et cetera. All he did was look for the longest streak of the same letter. Because as you noted at the beginning of your comments, there is going to be a streak somewhere. Yep. But yep. when we flip the imaginary coin, we don't come up with a streak of five or six heads or tails in a row. Well, it's a good so. it's a good illustration of the difference between uh, statistics and actual outcomes. That some people miss the fact that statistics are to describe the general you know behavior of what to expect. But statistics can't tell you the actual outcome is what we get, which will fit in that statistical framework. So it's it's an important point. Yeah. So the point of this story is we want to avoid data mining, first of all, which is how Dimensional came up with that letter M. They just told the computer to find it. We've mentioned, I think, in previous discussions, the David Lean Weber's uh, Analysis he found the best predictor of the S&P 500 was butter production in Bangladesh, right? But people attribute skill to almost every outcome. I mean, the champions of the, in the Olympics, the best soccer team is likely to win, 
Not necessarily, right? Uh, the fastest runner is going to win that skill in any sport where we have almost like one-on-one -on -one or a team competition. But we, as we discussed in investing, the nature of the competition is very different. You're competing against the collective wisdom of the market, and that changes the game. So what we have to think about is, can we look at other examples of winning streaks, and did it tell us anything? Well, I mentioned Bill Miller. That was that famous Leg Mason fund. He did something that even what most people consider the greatest mutual fund investor of all time was Peter Lynch. And he did something Lynch never did. He won 15 years in a row. And after that, he did so poorly, he was fired. <laughs> never. You know. uh, I remember that and, going on. And it was just like horrifying seeing him collapse, you know. Yep. And what happened is exactly what you would expect. Investors skeptical early. So the fund had very little money when he had his best returns. Then it had massive amount of assets. And then he did poorly. And so most people missed the great at returns and got the lousy returns. And then they dumped them, right? Uh, but that's not the only example. My favorite one is a fellow, you know, we think of Peter Lynch as the greatest fund investor of all time. And his uh, era was the 70s. But Peter Lynch was not, this is something most people don't know, was not the number one fund manager in the 70s, his best decade by far. It was a fellow named David Baker who ran a company called, or a fund called 44 Wall Street. Have you ever heard of David Baker? Nope. <laughs> Well, he out Lynch Lynch, and yet in the next decade, the S&P uh, went up, let's see if I can find that number, went up uh, almost 18% a year. And David Baker's fund lost 73% of his money, the investor money. Mm. How do you do, you couldn't do that if you tried to be that bad. So there's two great examples, and we have one other in the book uh, that had beat the S&P 11 years in a row from 74 through 84 it was the Linda Large Cap Value Fund. And over the next uh, 18 years, it underperformed by eight and a half percent a year. You know, we have to be very careful to not attribute skill when we have such huge numbers of professionals trying to outperform, just randomly, some are going to succeed, just like randomly the letter M. You have to really be careful. So I, I think you need to help people think this through because it's a bit of a diff difficult one. I mean, because we're brought up, all of us probably are brought up to tell, be told by our parents, for instance, that the outcomes that you achieve are due to the efforts that you put in. And there is a whole indoctrination that, uh, you know, has has helped a lot of people to think that that success is not due to luck. Imagine if we went to a young person and we said, sorry, kid, your outcomes are going to be completely due to luck. Well, it's going to demoralize them. So there's a there's a there's a moral aspect to it of why we tell people that, you know, your efforts are important. So we come into this world with this frame. A framework. And you've already explained that, you know, we're, we're, we're competing against an, an incredible force that is way beyond what we imagine it is as far as the efficiency of it. But I want to talk about the other side of it. How do we identify skill? I, and I'm thinking also, we've also talked about how, uh, you know, stock market is one thing, but, you know, baseball or other things, uh, are not the exact same thing as you're competing against everybody, against this collective. But how do we put skill into this whole context? Yeah. So again, I, I think what you have to think about, of course, skill matters in almost everything. But you have to understand the nature of the competition is very different, right? We can watch two tennis players like uh, Jokovic and Nadal they go out just the other day, and you knew with a high degree of certainty that Jokovic was going to beat Nadal 
where 10 years ago, you could not have made that prediction. They were fairly equal. But today, their skill sets are different. Nadal's body, you know, he's 38. Uh, and it's, you know, no longer able to stand up to that rigor. And every sport, you don't get to be, for example, a great pianist without practicing thousands of hours a day, right? The difference here is you're not competing in a game of one-on-one -on -one like you are against another pianist to see who's the greatest pianist in the world. And statistics here can help because what we can do is to see what would should we randomly expect with a large database of people trying something called the T-statistic tells us if there's at least a likelihood that this was skill, right? So if you run 20 experiments, one of them will have a 5% chance just randomly of being a success, right? So if that tells you if you run 100 tests and you have a T-stat of two, you're, you're meaningless. Mm. If you don't have a theory to support why that should work. If you come up with this theory first and then just run one test and you find the T-stat was two, now you could say, ah, oh, there's a 95%, we're not certain, okay, that it's skill. If the T-stat was three, there's a 99% chance there's skill. So the problem today we face is we have such high speed computers and massive databases we didn't have 40, 50 years ago, that anyone could take the data and come up with the Larry Swedro Investment Trust and whatever the data says is that. But just because you have a correlation doesn't mean there's causation. You have to be really careful here to attribute skill. And with 10,000 mutual funds out there, randomly we're gonna expect some to outperform for very long periods. You have to therefore be very careful to before you assume it's skill. And even if it is skill, we've talked about a book I've written called The Incredible Shrinking Alpha. It's getting harder and harder. And this, even if you are skillful, like Peter Lynch, we could probably attribute some of his early success to skill. But he was running a very small amount of money when he had the best returns. By the time he retired, he had, his alpha was very close to zero the last few years. The market, one, had caught up and discovered his secret sources to some degree, like he was a value investor early. Uh, uh, and then he got this huge infos, and now he's got big market impact costs, and he had to diversify to avoid that. Now you can't generate alpha, or it became much harder. So is one of the lessons of this is when you see outperformance, the first thing you should do is attribute it to randomness? Uh, it depends on the activity. If I'm well, watching a tennis match, about, I would. If we're just talking about the stock market and the performance right. of fund managers and we're looking at performance and we see a list that someone shows us, hey, these are the guys that outperform, these are the men or women or whatever, that outperform, should we immediately think, you know, would we be safe to say, yes, I agree that they outperform, but I'm going to assume that that was from luck? Yeah, uh, I wouldn't say it exactly that way, but the first thing you should do is look at what the historical empirical research on the subject has found. And all the empirical research says there's no evidence of persistence of performance by fund managers beyond what we should randomly expect. In a normal distribution, you're gonna find some in the left tail that perform very poorly. And maybe that was either high expenses or maybe it was just bad luck. Mm. On the other hand, you could have some, and you're going to have some in that right tail. Now it might be skill or it might be luck. And if the, if the empirical evidence found bigger fat tails than we should expect randomly, then you could say, maybe there's a reasonable chance it's skill. And I, now I have to do more diligence to make sure I can find 
you know, what is the distinguishing characteristics that it's a neighbor? What's in their secret sauce? Okay. The problem is there's no evidence in all the studies that I've seen of anything beyond you know, random outperforming. Yeah, so that was my next question is after all this years of work, have you, it, can you definitively say that one person or one situation showed a persistence due to skill or can you say that yeah, there is? I think, we, I think we could say it very clearly. Warren Buffett had, and Charlie Munger had a lot of skill, but they told the world their secret sauce and academics did what we could call reverse engineering, uh, fed their computers and say, hey, can we identify traits of stocks so we could buy an index of stocks that have those same traits and can we match their performance? And that's what's happened. Uh, and Buffett yeah, and, has and, not and, been and, able to outperform for the last 18 years or so. Yeah, and, and you, you don't even have to telegraph what you're doing. The market will perceive it by reading the re, what, what your disclosures are, watching market movements, and that's where it, the efficiency becomes, you know, enormous. Yeah, here, you know, we see these great uh, high-frequency trading funds, or let's say Renaissance technology, and they hire world-class scientists and they pay tens of millions of dollars to buy the most sophisticated computers and park them you know, slightly closer to the exchange so they could get the trading information a millisecond before everybody else. And so now these people go on and they outperform. And then some people say, well, why should I let the owner of their fund, he's paying me pretty well, but I can leave. I know the secret sauce. And they leave and go start their own fund. And then the secret sauce has a problem because they're competing in that small little space to try to extract alpha. So success does breed its own seeds of destruction. So um, one other thing that I wanted to address was that I think there's a lot of people that would be pretty upset with what you've said. There's a lot of people out there that are working very hard to build skills um, and they see the performance that they've done so far and they're attributing it to their hard work. And we're not talking about a small number now, Larry. So I, I want to address the, the 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 huge volume of participants that believe that their development of their knowledge and their skill and their experiences are all coming together to produce something beyond luck. What's going on there? How could they all think that when you've described that it's a very different situation? Well, we know and we discussed before that probably the most common human trait is overconfidence. <laughs> so uh, overconfidence there are all bias. kinds of tests yep. on that, including if you ask people if they're a better than average driver, 80 to 90 percent of them will say yes. Well, that's impossible. It doesn't matter whether you ask them, are you a better than average stock picker? They'll say they're, of course, better than it can't be that more than half are better. And you not only have to be better, you have to be a lot better because you have costs, right? If you're going to play that game and your competition isn't you or me, and maybe they're smarter than we are. The competition is Renaissance technology today. That's who they're competing against. World-class mathematicians, scientists with a lot more resources than they likely have. What's their advantage that they can identify? So I tell people, unless you look in the mirror and see Warren Buffett, and then even acknowledge that Buffett hasn't been able to do it for the last 18 years, you know, the odds are good that your outperformance is probably attributed to luck. Doesn't mean you're not smart. We don't want to confuse that issue. You could be highly intelligent, as almost all these mutual fund managers who lose almost certainly are. The problem is the competition's too tough and they have expenses. I guess the way I'm thinking about it is like um, we've created a monster, you know, like if you go to a weightlifting competition and all the humans are there and they're hitting some, you know, peak and then some huge monster comes in and pushes away beyond what any human could ever do. And that's kind of the way I think about it from the market. Yeah. So let me add this uh, point. There, the market is a machine that is moving to become 
more efficient over time. We learn uh, that there may be pockets of inefficiency and the very act of exploiting them moves the prices towards where they should be. So let's say that Andrew Stotts, you know, brilliant mathematician in Thailand, he discovers some anomaly in the Thai mortgage market. Mm. So he raises a fund of a hundred million bucks or, you know, a billion dollar, whatever. And now he exploits it. And now money comes rushing in and other people try to reverse engineer. And the Thai mortgage market is very little. And there's just not a lot of alpha there if everyone's doing. So what the way these, you know, you only way you can keep generating is finding these new sources. So it gets harder and harder because every day, really smart people are trying to uncover these niches uh, and just getting harder and harder to outperform. Okay, so let's wrap this up by... Um... Thinking about a young person that that wants to apply their brain and their knowledge and you know their understanding and they're hardworking and they want to maximize their wealth and and they now understand that okay what I'm going to do with the stock market is take the wealth that I'm creating and put it in maybe some sort of index fund type of thing some factor based exposure and I'm just going to let that grow but now I'm going to turn my direction towards creating the wealth that I want to create for my family and my legacy. Where would you say is the best place that they should be competing where the odds are? I mean, we've identified where not to compete based upon this discussion, but do you see any places where they should be competing to maximize the the value they get for the time and knowledge that they have? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, uh, And the way I personally would answer it, the objective is not to create the most wealth, but to live a meaningful life. And the answer about what you should pursue, if I told you wanted to get rich, one, you've got to be, you know, super, super smart, you know, uh, in the Mensa kind of IQ, go to work for some hedge fund renaissance technology, or maybe some biotech firm and invent a cure for cancer or something like that. And you can get rich that way. But there's only a small percentage of the people on the planet who are in that top one or two percent. The rest of us should find something that you know we enjoy, we love. I tell people I'll retire when it feels like I'm going to work. Uh, I love what I do. Uh, and you should find something that enables you to live a meaningful life and get and, and enjoy that. Hopefully it puts enough food on the table uh, for you to, you know, live reasonably well as well. Great advice. I think part of, um, what can help you to live a meaningful life is to not get caught up in the excitement of the market and understand (laughs) through our discussions that, you know, there are ways to, to benefit from the stock market, you know, but you've got to understand these core principles. So I think that's a great thing. And I totally agree about living a meaningful life. I think one of the things that uh, I love is that, you know, every day I get up and do what what I like to do. And I know I remember the advice that you gave me when I was talking about, you know, what to do with my podcast and other things. And you said, the question is, do you like doing it? And if you like doing it, keep doing it. And so I think that's great advice for all the listeners out there. Find what you love to do, do it, use the stock market for the benefit that it has, but don't get caught up in thinking that you're going to beat it. Yeah, I I think you're much better off spending your time on your passions. And you can't do that if you're spending your time trying to find the next great stock, right? Unless that is your passion. If that's your passion, you know, God bless you and good luck. And there's still still plenty of careers to build in the world of finance and helping people to overcome their behavioral biases and understand these core principles and build their wealth, you know, over time. So. Yep. Uh, well, exactly. Exciting. Well, Larry, I want to thank you for another great discussion. I think that one ended with some meaningful uh, discussion about life. So I'm looking forward to the next chapter, which is chapter 12, outfoxing the box. Oh, my goodness. Can't wait for that one. For listeners out there who want to keep up with what Larry's doing, it's just relentless. The man is relentless. Find, follow him on Twitter at Larry Swedro and follow him on LinkedIn. 
And this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.